Dear Chair, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Firstly, I would like to thank the conference committee for giving me opportunity to convey my speech here. Before my presentation, as a recipient of the Jackson Award, I would like to express my sincerest gratefulness to the Clay Minerals Society for offering such great honor. I really appreciate the award committee for their strong support and Professor Bruno Danson, the previous president of the Criminal Society, who kindly informed me of the exciting news. Here, I would like to give my special thanks to Professor Joe Stuck for his kindest nomination. I met Joe for the first time during his trip to China 10 years ago. I was impressed by his passion for science and the kindness for others. Since then, we started not only our long-lasting collaboration, but also our friendship that lasts long. Also, I would thank many of my friends Although some of them are not attending the conference, Professor Ray Frost, Peter Sabine, Ali Yuji, Louis Sun, Faiza Bergia, Benison, and many others. So many names I want to mention and thank, but so little time I was given. Last but not the least, I would like to thank my family for their endless love and support. Thank you very much. I wish you all a great conference experience and enjoy your travel in Turkey. The topic of my talk is transformation of Guangwang clay minerals into smectite and hydrothermal conditions. As we may know, the evolution of the Earth is pivotal for the formation of the present habitable Earth. In this process, minerals evolve as a consequence of a range of physical, chemical, and biological processes. Thus, the resulting minerals will record the history of the Earth's evolution, including changes in mineral diversity, crystal structure, chemical compositions, as well as mineral morphology. These changes and the related information are helpful for us to reconstruct the evolutionary history of the Earth and will understand some pivotal events in the evolution history of the Earth. Minerals, as a carriers of elements, they can bring elements to deep Earth with plate subduction and also can transport them to the Earth's surface via volcanic eruption, resulting in element cycling. In these geological processes, various valuable ores can form, and they are of great importance for industries and the sustainable development of human society. Clean minerals are a class of phyllosilicates. silicates with specific structure and morphology. As we may know, silicon oxygen tetrahedral sheet and octahedral sheet are the basic units for clay minerals. Based on the combining ways, different clay minerals can be formed. For example, colonite is a typical 1-1 clay mineral and montmolinite is a typical 2-1 clay mineral. Because of the unique structure and properties, clay minerals are important mineral resources and have been widely used in a lot of industries as well as in our daily life. The particle size of clay minerals is commonly less than 2 micrometer, so they have a large surface area. They are natural nanomaterials and are widely used as adsorbents. The cations in their interlayer spaces are exchangeable, so they can fix heavy metals in soils. Importantly, their interlayer structure and surface property 
can be modified via cation exchange reaction. Organoclase and pyridoclase are typical hybrid materials that are prepared from clay minerals. Clay minerals have reactive groups on the base of surfaces and edges, which give clay minerals excellent surface reactivity. Thus, clay minerals hydrophilic surfaces can be changed to hydrophobic ones via saline grafting. This is a critical step for clay minerals application in the field of organic materials. More importantly, the clay mineral layers are rigid and they can be exfoliated to single layers. Therefore, clay minerals have been extensively used in the preparation and application of clay-based nanomaterials. Since clay minerals are ubiquitous in the Earth's crust, they have prominent effects on element cycling. For example, Regardless hosted rare earth element deposits are dominant heavy rare earth element natural repositories discovered in South China. These deposits are hosting more than 80% of the total heavy rare earth element and supporting 95% of the global demand. In a weathering profile, we can find a regular mineral evolution. For example, from the bedrock to the topsoil, there is a desilication process for phyllosilicates. From mic in the bedrock to smectite, elite, vermiculite in the semi weather zone, then to colinite and hillside in the completely weathered zone, and finally, Bomite occurs in the topsoil. Generally, mineral evolution leads to the release and enrichment of rare earth elements within a weathering crust. And the clay minerals, such as colonite and hyalocyte, are dominant carriers of rare earth elements. More importantly, since rare earth elements are adsorbed on clay mineral surfaces, they are readily to be exchanged by other kinds such as ammonium and further to be collected. Clay minerals are also widespread at the surface of the mass. In typical Martian clay mineral sequences, there is a mineral transition from non chernite at the low part to colonite in the middle part, and finally to alunite in the upper part of the sequence. The gradual upwards enrichment of immobile element aluminum, indicated by spectral plossing, should be the result of leaching of the mobile elements. This is similar to the chemical weathering profiles on the Earth. We found that the ferric ion is depleted in the upper part of the sequence, but concentrated in the middle. It suggests a downward transport of ferrous ion in the weathering profile. This trend is similar to the iron loss on early Earth from Paleosol before the Great Oxidation event. Therefore, Clemenor's evolution indicates that a reducing atmosphere existed on early Mars. In a subduction zone, besides clay minerals from sediments, they can also form through water mineral reaction, such as serpentinization. Generally, serpentinization results in the formation of serpentine and blue site and something can further transform to talc. In fact, the physical chemical environment in a subduction zone is very complicated. Thus, maybe not only serpentine, blue site, and talc are forming. Other minerals, such as hydrotalkite 
and smack tight group min loss are also most possibly formed. These resulting climbing loss can bring a huge quantity of water and metals to deep earth, thus further affect the global element cycling. Here we can find climbing loss and their evolutions are important and helpful for understanding the planet's history and the pivotal geological events as well as formation of mineral resources. So far, three types of transformation pathways for clay minerals have been identified. One is the transformation between two one clay minerals, such as elitization of smectite and glauconization of smectite. This type transformation has been widely found in the nature. 2-1 clay minerals can also be transformed to 1-1 type like colonization of smectite. In contrast, the transformation from 1-1 clay mineral to 2-1 minerals is less found and reported, of which elitization of colonite that was the most found and reported. Correspondingly, two transformation mechanisms have been proposed. One is solid state transformation. It means the transformation takes place in a solid state. For example, elitization of smectite is a conversion between two one clay minerals in a solid state. In this process, Iron diffusion in and out of the structure controls the transformation. Meanwhile, stripping off one tetrahedral sheet from two one clay minerals can also result in the transformation from smectite to colonite. We call it colonization of smectite. The other one is dissolution recrystallization. It means dissolution of the original mineral followed by recrystallization of a new mineral. Generally, in these processes, the fluid and log ratio is a key factor that controls the transformation process. As I just mentioned, compared with the other two transformation pathways, the transformation from 1-1 one, one clay minerals to 2-1 type is much less found in the nature. Therefore, what we concern is can all 1-1 one, one type clay minerals transform into 2-1 smectite? And what pathway or mechanism is involved in their transformations? If such transformation can take place, it may be an important pathway for the formation of 2-1 clay minerals such as smectite. Also, such transformation can well explain the origin of the polar structure in mixed layer clay minerals. This is a structure model of hectolite layer, which is composed of regular stacking of elite and smectite layers. Here, we should note that the chemical compositions of these two silicon oxygen tetrahedral sheets are different. So far, both ion diffusion and dissolution recrystallization mechanisms cannot explain the origin of such structure. Importantly, based on this reaction, we can synthesize smectite group minerals from 1-1 one, one clay minerals. For example, saponite is less abundant in the nature, but of higher economic value. Hence, we can synthesize saponite by using abundant serpentine. Thus, we conduct a hydrothermal experiment to investigate the possibility of the transformation from 1-1 one, one clay minerals to 2-1 smectite and transformation mechanism involved. 
We used collinite, herosite, lizardite, and antigolite as a starting minerals, and metasilicate as a source of silicon. Here, collinite and herosite are typical dioxidal minerals, while lizardite and antigolite are trioxidal minerals. But collinite and herosite have different morphologies and the lizardite and anticolite have different microstructure. In the hydrothermal experiments, for collinite and helocytes, the ratio of silicon to aluminum was fixed at 2 to 1. And for lizardite and anticolite, the ratio of silicon to magnesium was fixed at 4 to 3. These ratios are close to those of bedlite and saponite, belonging to smectite group minerals. After hydrothermal experiments, the products were collected and characterized by using a combination of characterization techniques, including XRD, FTIR, TG, TM, and mass MMR. Here are the oriented XRD patterns of helocyte and its hydrothermal products. This is a characteristic reflection of helocyte. The basal spacing is about 0.72 nanometer. After one or two weeks, the reflection of helocyte disappeared and a new reflection occurred at about 1.24 nanometer. Upon acetylene glycolation, the basal spacing increased to 1.7 nanometer. This means the newly formed mineral has swelling property. Thus, the XRD analysis imply the formation of smectite. For colonite, the transformation is similar to that of helocyte. After hydrothermal reaction, the reflection of colonite was prominently decreased, while a new reflection occurred at about 1.26 nanometer. And upon glycolation, the basal spacing increased to 1.68 nanometer. But we can find that a small amount of colonite was still present in the products after one or two weeks reaction. This indicates that colonite can be transformed to smectite, but the transformation rate of colonite is lower than that of helocyte. This suggests that the mineral morphology may affect the transformation reaction. Here are the TG and the DTG curves of helocyte, colonite, and their reaction products. We can find that after hydrothermal treatment, the mass loss of the hydrocylation of a vessel decreased. This reflects that part of the surface hydrocells were consumed during the transformation from helocyte and colonite to smectite. Also, we can find a slight increase of mass loss at about 150 degrees. This is due to the coordinate water molecules of the interlayer cations in the newly formed smectite. Meanwhile, the dehydrocylation temperature of the newly formed smectite is obviously lower than that of natural smectite. This is due to the poor crystallinity of the newly formed smectite. FTIR spectra also provide important evidence for the successful transformation. We can find that the well-resolved OH vibrations for helocyte and the colonite merged into a broad one at 3667. This is indicative of OH stretching vibration in bed light. Also, the vibration at 
912 is attributed to the bending vibration of inner surface hydrocells in hyalocyte and colonite. After hydrothermal treatment, the intensity of this vibration dramatically decreased. This suggests the consumption of inner surface OH during their transformations. Thus, FTIR spectra provide convincing evidence for the successful transformation from helocyte and colonite to smectite. HRTM observation can provide direct evidence for the successful transformation. Here are the HRTM images of helocyte, colonite, and their transformation products. Layers with thickness of 1 to 1.5 nanometer can be found in all products. They are typical 2-1 criminal layers instead of colonite and helocyte layers. Also, TM images clearly show that the transformation starts from the edges of the precursor minerals. Our further EDS analysis shows that their chemical compositions are similar to that of bedlite. The above results demonstrate that both helocyte and colonite can transform into smectite readily and hydrothermal conditions. As we may know, both helocyte and colonite belong to typical dioctahedral structure. Here, the question is how about serpentine minerals such as lizardite and antigolite? They are trioctahedral structure minerals. Therefore, we conducted similar experiments on lizardite and antigolite and identical conditions as for helocyte and colonite. After hydrothermal reaction, a prominent reflection of lizardite at about 0.73 nanometer remained, and a weak reflection occurred at about 1.4 nanometer. After glycolation, the reflection at 1.4 nanometer increased to 1.72 nanometer. The newly formed phase shows a swelling property. This suggests that lizardite can be transformed into smectite, but more difficult than helocyte and the colonite. Here, we should note a prominent reflection of quartz occurred. This is different from the cases of colonite and helocyte. The occurrence of quartz is due to the slow transformation rate and the residual metasilicate forming the quartz. Here are the XRD patterns of antigolite and its hydrothermal products. Similar to the case of lizardite, the prominent reflection of antigolite at about 0.72 nanometer remained, and a new reflection occurred at about 1.29 nanometer. Very interesting, the reflection at 1.29 nanometer remained unchanged upon glycolation. This means that the newly formed mineral does not have any swelling ability. This is key evidence for the transformation taking place in a solid state. I will give a detailed discussion in the following part of the transformation mechanism. Here are the TG and the DTG curves of lizardite and the golite and their reaction products. We can find that, similar to helocyte and the colonite, the mass loss of the hydrocylation decreased after hydrothermal treatment. This is due to the consumption of surface hydrocells of lizardite and antigolite during their transformations. Also, we find that in the case of lizardite, a prominent mass loss 
occurred around 150 degrees. This should be attributed to the loss of the interlayer watch in the newly formed smectite. However, in the case of antigolite, there is no significant mass loss of interlayer watch around 150 degrees. This is very different from the cases of lizardite, hydroxide, and collite. Such difference may not only reflect a lower transformation ratio for anticolite, but also may be related to the specific structure and the property of the resulting minerals. According to the changes of the hydrocell quantity before and after reactions, we had a rough evaluation of the transformation ratio. For lizardite, our calculations show that the transformation ratio is about 22% after one week and about 30 after two weeks. However, the transformation ratios for anticolite are much lower than lizardite, about 3% after one week and 6% after two weeks. Such prominent differences are closely related to their distinct microstructures. We may know, lizardite is a typical layer clay mineral, while there is tetrahedral unit inversion in anticolite. Thus, the structural layers of anticolite are linked via unit inversion, and the transformation reaction was stopped in the inversion sites. Our previous study about synthesis of saponite showed that the aluminum occupancy in saponite had an important effect on the formation of saponite and crystal growth. Aluminum is prior to occupying tetrahedral sites via the substitution of aluminum for silicon. This can improve the size match between the tetrahedral and the octahedral sheets. Meanwhile, saponite with less aluminum in the octahedral sites has bigger crystal size, and the layer stacking along the C-axis is more ordered. Based on this, we added a small amount of aluminum about 1% of lizardite into the reaction system of lizardite. We find that the reflection intensity of smectite was obviously increased. This suggests that addition of aluminum can significantly accelerate the growth of smectite. Meanwhile, the product shows the swelling property after glycolation further confirm the formation of smectite. This suggests that existence of aluminum in the reaction system is beneficial for the transformation reaction. The above results indicate that both dioctahedral clay minerals, including colonite and hydroxide, and trioctahedral clay minerals, such as lizardite and anticolite can transform into smectite. But colonite and hydroxide are more readily to be converted to smectite than lizardite and anticolite. Now we want to answer the question, what is the transformation pathway or mechanism involved in their transformations? Firstly, we conducted dissolution experiments without any metasilicate in the reaction systems. But the conditions are completely identical to those for the transformation experiments with metasilicate. All the results, including XRD, FTIR, TG, and HRTEM observation, show that no obvious changes for the precursor minerals before and after 
dissolution experiment. Meanwhile, our measurements show that the concentration of the dissolved aluminum in the supernatants is as low as 1 or 2 ppb in the halocyte and the colonite systems, while the concentration of magnesium is as low as 2 to 3 ppm in the lizardite and antigolite systems. This means that the solution and recrystallization is not a dominant pathway for the transformation reaction. The case of antigolite provides convincing evidence for a solid state transformation. Now, let us have a look at the XRD patterns of antigolite transformation products. We find that after hydrothermal reaction, a new reflection occurred at about 1.29 nanometer. It should be attributed to the newly formed 2,1 mineral. But the glycolation tests show this newly formed mineral does not display any swelling property. Importantly, HRTEM image shows that smectite is only formed at the margin of anticolite particles. This enlarged image clearly shows the edge is composed of layers with a thickness of about 1.2 nanometer, while the inner part of the particle is anticolite. Such a phenomenon can be well explained by the specific structure of anticolite and provide convincing evidence for a solid state transformation. Here is a structure figure of anticolite. The octahedral sheets are continuous and wavy, whereas the tetrahedral sheets undergo periodic reversals. Anticolite layers are bound via strong covalent bonds between the reversals. If the solution recrystallization happened during the transformation, the resulting smectite should have swelling ability since they are formed in a solution. However, we find the newly formed smectite-like mineral is non-swelling and is mainly formed on the margins of anticolite particles. This is most possibly because the transformation took place in a solid state. In this case, the strong covalent bonds between the two reversals will stop a further transformation towards the inner part of a particle. And those newly formed smectite layers are linked by the silicon oxygen bonds. Thus, they will not show swelling property. Therefore, the case of anticolite strongly suggests a solid state transformation. HRTEM images of colonite and its reaction products clearly show the transformation process. The transformation starts from the edges of particles, and silicon oxygen tetrahedra act as wedges to intercalate into the interlayer space then attached to the octahedral sheet of colonite. Step by step, layer by layer, the transformation proceeds towards the inner part of a particle. And finally, a complete transformation of colonite to smectite. Here, we should note that the newly formed tetrahedral sheets may have the substitution of aluminum for silicon. Thus, their chemical compositions may be different from the original tetrahedral sheet inherited from precursor colonite. Such a composition difference between the original and the neoformed tetrahedral sheets can explain the origin of the polar structure. Our atomic force microscopy observations provide further evidence for the solid state transformation. Here are AFM images of the hydrothermal product from lizardite. Our measurements show that the height of the particle's edges are obviously larger than that of the central part. 
or further calculations show that the height ratio of the edge to the ascent is similar to that of 2-1 layer to 1-1 one, one layer. This strongly suggests that the transformation starts from the edge of the mineral particles. This is consistent with the TN observations. For example, for particle AB, there are 13 smectite layers at the edge and 13 lizardite layers at its central part. That is to say, the central part is composed of lizardite, while the edges are composed of smectite. This strongly suggests that the transformation starts from the edges and a solid state transformation has been involved. In the case of lizardite, besides the transformation pathway of one lizardite layer to one smectite layer, similar to hilocyte and colinite, we find that one smectite layer also can be formed through the merge of two lizardite layers. This process is accompanied by partial dissolution of lizardite layers. This may be due to the extensive occurrence of the substitutions such as aluminum for magnesium and aluminum for silicon. These substitution sites are crystal defects with high energy and are readily to dissolve. Therefore, pure smectite nanoparticles were occasionally formed. This suggests that dissolution recrystallization may also be involved in the transformation, but not a dominant pathway. In the case of antigolite, besides antigolite particles covered by a very thin layer of newly formed smectite, we also observed antigolite particles with very long smectite layers. The length of these smectite layers can reach more than 100 nanometers, and the length is much larger than a half supercell repeat unit in anticolite. This implies that the epitaxial growth of smectite layers might also be involved in the transformation process. In order to know where the aluminum exists in the resulting smectite, we conducted mass MMR measurement. Here are aluminum spectra of hilocyte, colinite, lizardite, and their hydrothermal products. We find for hilocyte and colinite, aluminum only occupies the octahedral sites. However, in the hydrothermal products, three aluminum signals recorded. Besides aluminum in octahedral sites, the signal at about 71 ppm should be attributed to four coordinate aluminum in the tetrahedral sheet, and the signal at about 55 ppm is attributed to aluminum in three-dimensional silica framework of amorphous phase. For lizard art, both the signals of aluminum in octahedral and tetrahedral sites were recorded. After hydrothermal treatment, the signal of aluminum in octahedral sheet disappeared, while that of tetrahedral sheets obviously increased. As no aluminum was added into the reaction systems, the change of aluminum signals strongly suggests that the migration of octahedral aluminum to tetrahedral sites via partial dissolution of precursor minerals. This is supported over HRTM observations as we just discussed. More importantly, Mass MMR spectra suggests that the newly formed tetrahedral sheets may be rich in the substitution of aluminum for silicon. Thus, the composition difference between the original tetrahedral sheet and the newly formed tetrahedral sheets can result in the formation of a polar structure. 
Our present study shows that the transformation from 1-1 clay minerals to 2-1 minerals and hydrothermal conditions is a very complicated process. 1-1 layers in the precursor minerals can be converted to 2-1 layers via a solid state transformation. In this process, the hydrolysis of metal silicate leads to the formation of silicon oxygen tetrahedral. These tetrahedral act as wedges to intercalate into the interlayer space and then attach to the octahedral sheet of 1-1 clay minerals. Step by step, 1-1 clay minerals can be converted to smectite. This should be a dominant way for the transformation under hydrothermal conditions. The transformation of serpentine minerals is more complicated than hillside and colinite. In the case of lizardite, both the mechanisms of solid state transformation and dissolution recrystallization were observed. But the solid state transformation is still a dominant pathway. Particularly, epitaxial growth of smectite was observed in the transformation process of anticolite. Our present study shows that the crystallographic characters of precursor minerals, such as mineral structure, morphology, as well as isomorphic substitutions, have prominent effects on their transformation pathway and mechanism involved. In summary, our study shows that 1-1 clay minerals can transform into smectite, but different pathways and mechanisms can be involved. Thus, we can synthesize smectite materials such as saponite with high economic value from 1-1 clay minerals. In the transformation for 1-1 clay minerals to smectite, solid state transformation is a dominant pathway. The substitution of aluminum for silicon were formed in all products. Such substitution may be able to improve the size match between the newly formed tetrahedral sheets and the octahedral sheets in the precursor minerals. This is critical for successful transformation. Since the newly formed tetrahedral sheets may be rich in aluminum, due to the substitution of aluminum for silicon. Thus, the chemical composition of the newly formed tetrahedral sheets may be different from the original sheets in the precursors. Therefore, we propose that solid state transformation may be a possible origin of the polar structure in mixed layer clay minerals. Thanks for your attention.